Well, good morning and welcome to our post-Christmas service where everybody is a little bit more tired than they normally would be. I'm grateful that y'all are here and that you're here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He is worthy. I hope you had a wonderful holiday season. Uh, I guess we're, we're now uh, from Thanksgiving all the way through Christmas, approaching New Year. And I, I hope you just continue it on all the way through uh, that you're able to sustain that. Uh, today in our Advent series, we're, we're turning our attention away from the, the coming or the arrival of Jesus Christ in the flesh the first time. And we're beginning to look at the second coming of Christ. Now, oftentimes when you think about the second coming of Christ, or you're going to start talking about that, um, you might think about the end time stuff that people get really wrapped up in sometimes. I, I don't know how it was for you. Uh, when I was a kid, people would get really, really into this stuff. And so they were really uh, serious about what your millennial position was. Are you pre-millennial, all-millennial, you know, mid-trib, post-trib, all of those sorts of things. And, and if you get a little anxious uh, about me talking about the second coming of Christ and what that's going to look like, I want to set your minds at ease today. Um, while I think those are worthy pursuits, that's not particularly what we're going to discuss today. As a matter of fact, what I want to talk to you about today is specifically where you are um, in relation to the second coming of Christ. I want to talk about you and Jesus Christ when he comes again. Where are you um, when you think about Jesus returning um, to gather his faithful to himself and ultimately to judge the world. Where do you stand with God in that scenario? Now, the good news is that Jesus taught us plenty. While we may not have all of our eschatological questions answered uh, uh, with regard to specifically what's going to happen in the end of days, uh, we do have a lot of questions answered for us. And specifically, uh, Jesus teaches us how we should think about his second coming and how we should prepare ourselves for those events. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Um, Jesus begins talking to his disciples, specifically telling them, hey, I'm going to be coming again. There's another arrival, if you will. I'm going to return again to this world. And, and he tells them, there, there are going to be a few signs that are going to suggest that my second coming is imminent. It's like there's going to be famines and earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars. Person is going to turn against person. But don't worry. These are just kind of the birth pains. Um, there's still a little bit of time to go. And then when the Son of Man comes again, when Jesus comes back for the second time, and it's going to come all of a sudden like nobody knows. This is going to be in verse 36. That's where we're going to pick up today of Matthew chapter 24. He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. So uh, if you have the crazy uncle or if you're reading, you know, the latest book that the guy has written on when Jesus is coming, uh, you can go ahead and just ignore them because Jesus was very, very explicit about this. No one knows the day and hour ultimately that he's going to come back, not even the angels in heaven nor the son, but the father alone. And so when we think about the second coming of Christ, we don't know when that's going to be. But Jesus makes some really interesting points that I think we need to pay attention to with regard to the second coming of Christ. He says this in verse 37, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. I think Noah, like the boat, right? Rain, 40 days, and, you know, sent the birds out. That, that story of Noah. And the answer is yes. Uh, the, the world become really wicked, um, and God was going to judge the world. He was going to annihilate everyone. Uh, and with regard to Moses and his family in particular, he had chosen to rescue them. And so in, in a day and age when it didn't rain, God tells Noah to build a boat. And, and you can imagine if your friend was building the boat and it had never rained, you would have made fun of him too, right? As they would have seen this, they would have thought he was out of his mind. And so here's what Jesus tells us about the days of Noah. He says, for in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they were living their lives just like nothing was going on. There was no danger imminent. There was no judgment or wrath. Kind of, like they were just living life until the day they entered the ark. Until the rain started to fall and the floodwaters began to rise. They didn't understand until the flood came and it took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. When we think about the second coming, we don't know when that's going to be. What we know is that many people are going to be living their lives as if nothing is approaching, living their lives, going about day to day, and they're going to be unprepared for the arrival 
of our coming king. He says this, there will be two men left in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. There will be two women grinding at the mill. Again, one taken, one left. And so therefore, in verse 42, be on the alert, for you don't know on which day your Lord is coming. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Y'all, we live in LaFleur County, right? We're Eastern Oklahoma people. If someone's coming to break in our house, we know it. We're calling all our redneck buddies. There's going to be a fight, right? We're not going to let someone come into our home, take our stuff, or hurt our family. We are going to prepare for that. And if that's the reaction that you have to hearing this little story Jesus tells us, it's the appropriate reaction. Of course I would prepare if I knew that a thief was coming. Verse 44, he says, good. For, for this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you don't think that he will. You should prepare for the second coming of Christ. I should prepare. We as a church should prepare for the second coming of Christ. He gives us a quick little story here. He says, Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. The master leaves and puts you in charge of some things. Blessed is the guy who took care of the things that he was supposed to be taking care of. And he gives us the other side. Truly I say to you, this person, he will be put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time. Man, he's been gone a while. There's a lot of hard work around here. And he begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards. That the master of that slave will come on a day when he doesn't expect him, and an hour which he does not know, and will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so Jesus is like, hey, son of man's coming back. There's going to be a judgment. There will be those who are men and women of faith, who know the Lord, who are genuine Christians and followers of God, and they're going to be those people who aren't. You need to be prepared. You need to make yourself ready for the second coming of Christ because the judgment is not going to be one that is pleasant. But Jesus wanted to be really, really clear he gives us three parables here. Kind of follow this initial teaching that he's, he's going to come, but we're not sure when he's going to come back again. He gives us three parables to help us understand and maybe to help us evaluate. That's probably a better way to say it. To help us evaluate whether we are indeed ready for the second coming of Christ. All right, so for the first one. It is the parable of the ten virgins. I'm going to paraphrase some here uh, because there's a lot of text we're still going to cover. Uh, but this parable of the ten virgins, it's actually one of a, a wedding banquet. And the way it worked in the first century wasn't quite like it is with us. Um, you don't like call your friend, hey, we're having dinner, 6.30, you know, and you know, show up, we'll have dinner ready. It's going to be hot and ready to go, you know, all that. That wasn't really how it worked in the first century. Um, instead, you would, there was actually a two-invitation kind of system. When you knew that you were going to throw a big wedding banquet, you would go out and send out the invites, like, who's coming? Who wants to be in? You know, we've got to make sure you got food for all you people, so y'all go ahead and RSVP. Who's coming, right? Um, but due to, well, we didn't have refrigeration and ways to keep things hot and all that, the preparations weren't quite as smooth back then as they are today, and so uh, they would set about the work of preparing the feast and the banquet and getting everything ready for this wedding feast. And then, once it was all ready, they would send out the second invitation. All right, y'all, it's ready. Y'all, come on. So Jesus tells us a story of these ten virgins who have already received the first invitation. They're going out to meet the bridegroom because they're ready to go to the party, right? However, they haven't yet got the second invitation. These ten virgins, they go out. There's only one distinction between the two. Um, some of them took extra oil for their lamps, um, some of them did not. And lo and behold, there's always that one relative, right? Uh, preparations got delayed. The party wasn't quite ready. And all of us who are on time kind of people, we get stuck waiting, right? Um, if you're the person that made your family wait yesterday, you should repent of that and be there early next year, right? So here's, here, that's kind of what's happening in the story. There is a delay. We're not ex told exactly it might not have been a rude family member, but there is a delay for whatever reason. Um, and the bride, they, or, or, I'm sorry, the virgins, they get sleepy. They're kind of tired. They all begin to nap, and all of a sudden the bridegroom comes. All right, it's time to come to the banquet, y'all. Y'all, come on. The banquet is prepared. 
Now, the five uh, virgins who had brought oil for their lamps, they're ready to go. All right, light them up. We're going to make our way to the banquet. But the five who did not, they had to go get oil for their lamps in order to make their way to the banquet. And when the, the five who had the oil got there, the doors are open wide, the feast is ready, they get to enter in and enjoy. But for those who didn't have oil that arrived a little bit later, the doors were shut. And they didn't get to enter in. And Jesus tells us this parable and he concludes it with verse 13. Be on the alert then, for you don't know the day nor the hour. So I would ask this question for you once again. Are you prepared for the second coming of Christ? We're not told when that's going to be. Uh, it could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. It could be 10 years, 100 years. We're not told at all. But Jesus would want us to be prepared. So maybe to evaluate how prepared you are, I want to ask you a question. Um, if today was your last day, and, you know, Things ended in the next moment or hour, and you were going to stand before God, and He would ask you why she why should let you into heaven. Um, what what answer would you give Him? Why should I let you in? Some people might point to well, I went to church. I went. Even that Sunday after Christmas, when most people were still sleeping in, right, had the Christmas Eve service, and then they did another one, right? Maybe you'd say, I went to church. I was pretty faithful in that. Or maybe you would talk about, you know, I was a pretty good dad, or husband, or mother, or, or wife, or friend, or you kind of extol your virtues, like I've lived a pretty good life. Matter of fact, for those of us who are in, in, in maybe in the South, we, we kind of think oftentimes, this is the, I hear this all the time from people, when we think about uh, our standing before God, most of us think about it kind of in terms of a scale. You got your good deeds and you got your bad deeds, and yeah, every one of us, we're going to acknowledge we sin. We're from the South. We know enough of the Bible to know we sin, right? But we hope that if we have enough good deeds, that those will kind of outweigh the bad. And so if we were to stand before God, we'd say, you know, I have, I've sinned, but you know, I've got a pretty a lot, several good things over here too, and maybe that outweighs it. Church, I'm really concerned about that sort of thinking because I think it tragically underestimates the holiness and the righteousness of God. Uh, I'm doing my chronological reading plan through the Bible. I just started it pretty recently, and so I've been in Exodus and Leviticus. And you read then about the tabernacle and about the priest who would enter into the presence of God, the holies of holies, in order to meet with God on behalf of the people. And the preparation that had to be made, like they were very, very extensive. It was a purification of the body. You have to wear a specific garment that was set aside for it, that was said to be holy. And then they would have to enter into the presence of God, and they would sprinkle blood in these very specific ways, seven times, and like very, very uh, careful about how they would approach God. Because here's the understanding. God was so holy and the people were not. And it's not something that we take lightly. Like he is holy and he is righteous. And when the sons of Aaron, they thought, you know what, I'm just going to burn some incense before the Lord. When they just did it on their own and they didn't follow God's prescribed ways, they dropped dead. For many of us, we tragically underestimate the holiness and the righteousness of God. We think, eh, you know, I, I sin, but everybody sins. It's really not a big deal, right? I mean, Jesus, didn't he, he forgave our sin? We're, we're kind of good with God. Listen, when we stand before God, and he's not going to ask us this question, but if he did ask us why he should let us into heaven, there is one answer that will suffice. Is that we would say, God, on the basis of my faith, in Jesus Christ, his blood that was shed on the cross to make an atoning sacrifice for my sins, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be here. But on the basis of your grace, on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ, I stand here. And that's why I believe that I should be given admittance into heaven. There's one answer, and it's not our works. But it's by the grace of God. It's our faith in him and his work on our behalf. So Jesus would want us to prepare for the second coming of Christ. You think about your life and standing before God. Are you trusting in your works, your good deeds, your ability to live a righteous life? 
Or are you that person who is poor in spirit, who knows that you don't deserve to be accepted, but you're standing on the grace of God alone, coming in faith alone to him in order to gain salvation, that when Jesus comes back, our hope is not in ourselves, but it's fully in Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 clarifies this for us. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no men may boast. Have you made preparation for the second coming of Christ? Have you stopped trusting in yourself and instead turned to him in faith, believing the gospel, trusting in Jesus Christ to save you? If so, good. If not, we're going to have time at the end of the service. We'll talk about that, right? I want, to, I want to share with you more. But Jesus doesn't stop there. And it's really interesting that Jesus didn't stop at this point. Um, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. That, that should be the end of the message, right? But Jesus, in t- teaching us about the end time, he has already warned us that some people are not going to be prepared. They're not going to have made preparation, and so he tells another story here. It's the second of the parables, and this one is the parable of the talents. I'm going to paraphrase this one for you as well. In the parable of the talents, there is a master who's going away on a journey, and he's going to entrust his money, his his stuff, to his servants. And so the first servant, he comes to him, and he says, hey, this guy, he's got a lot of skill. He's pretty good at managing things. Man, he's he's shown him. He can do some things. I'm going to give him five talents. And the man who was entrusted with five talents, that's a unit of money, by the way, um, he puts that money to work. <clears throat> I'm guessing it was agriculturally. We're not told in the story, but uh, maybe the guy bought a field. Or maybe he bought a bunch of seed, hired a few workers, and began to cultivate the soil in that field. And so he would have you know, planted the field, fertilized the, seal of the field, made sure the weeds were pulled. And over a period of time, the man who was entrusted with five talents, um, he doubled the money. I don't know about y'all, but that's a pretty solid investment. If I wish I had people that I could entrust with money, that when I came back, they doubled it, right? This guy did a great work on behalf of his master. Like, in terms of stewarding his money, I want this guy to be my steward, right? I want him to take care of my stuff. This servant, the master, when he returned after a long delay, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Man, you've been faithful with these things. I'm going to entrust you with even more. And the story was true also of the second servant who was only given two talents, but maybe he just bought some animals, you know, maybe bought some some cattle and they reproduced and, and he too doubled the money for his master. And so after a long time, the master comes back. Hey, what have you done with, you know, what I've entrusted to you? Well, Tell you what I've done, I've, I've doubled your money. You know, I've been a good and well, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with these things. I'm going to entrust you with even more. But in this story that Jesus tells us, there is a third type of servant, and he was only entrusted with one talent. The master comes back after a long time. Hey, what, have, what have you done with what I've entrusted to you? And the servant, who must have been not really looking forward to this day, says, well, no worries, actually. I've, I've got it right here. Oh, I've got to dig it up. I, I dug a hole and I buried it. It's, it's a little, little dirty. Let me dust it off. And he gives it back to his master. And Jesus, in telling the parable, and the master is angry, he calls him a wicked and a lazy slave. And in verse 30 of Matthew chapter 25, he says, Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What you should see here Outer darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth. This is a description of hell. And if it kind of bothers you a bit that this seems like Jesus would be saying, teaching in the story that if we're not good stewards, then maybe something bad awaits us. Uh, I want to I walk you through that a bit, but it should bother you. You should feel that to some extent. Now, just to be clear, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and not by any works. Like, I want to be really clear, the first, the first parable should clear that up for us. However, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, but genuine faith in Jesus Christ is never alone. 
when our hearts have been transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we've been indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, we are not what we once were. And we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And we begin to see, when we, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we come to understand that He is Lord, that we are indeed His servants. We're disciples of Jesus Christ. And that we are to be obedient to whatever He would call us to do. We see that every single thing that we have in our lives, our gifts, our talents, our abilities, our finances, our homes, our cars, our clothes, all of those things have been entrusted to us by God and that ultimately we are supposed to invest those things, utilize those things for the good of our master's kingdom. And then if you live your entire life and you just think that all the things that you have, they're not given to you by God. Maybe you, I worked hard for this, right? This is our southern way of dealing with things often, right? We're at personal responsibility. I worked hard and I saved my money and I bought my house and I don't have to share it with anybody, right? Rather than seeing God as the giver of good gifts who has entrusted these things to us in order that we'd steward them for the good of his kingdom, we can often think, no, 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 I did this. Our hearts can be filled with pride, and rather than utilizing the things God has given to us in a way that's going to honor God and extend his kingdom, we dig a hole. and We bury them. We keep them right there safe. We don't utilize them for any good end. Here's the thing. If you would say, first parable, no, 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 I'm ready to meet Jesus. I'm ready for the second coming. I'm ready. But you look at your life, and when it comes to your possessions or the things, material things of this world, and it's really, it's all about you and all your time and your money and your energy, it's all about you and yours, and you're not stewarding those things for the good of the kingdom, you should question whether you are truly prepared for the second coming of Christ. And if there's no transformation uh, in your heart with regard to your possessions and the things of this world, where you find your affinity for the things of this world to be less and less and your love for God to be more and more, there may be something wrong. You have reason to question whether you truly know Jesus Christ. Think about this in terms of the master-slave relationship. You're, say you're a master and you have a slave and you entrusted him. Hey, hey, I'm going to give this to you. I want you to steward it, you know, take care of my affairs, you know, go and produce a return for me. And that slave dug a hole and buried it. What do you think he did the whole time you were gone? Like kick his feet up, like sleeping in your bed. He's got, I mean, what is he doing? And he's, he's honestly, his life's just all about him. He doesn't care anything about you. Many of us would call Jesus Lord. All ourselves disciples. I'm a servant of God. And yet as we look at our lives, we're not actually serving God. We're only serving ourselves. And maybe even going a step further than that, many of us, not only are we not serving God, we're really asking Him to serve us. God, would you bless my family and my business and you know, keep my health good and give me comfort and peace and all the things that I want from you? Sometimes we can get that relationship upside down. We are here to serve a risen and a worthy King Jesus who died that we might find life. And when we love him, we find the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in the field, the thing which is worth giving up all other things to find that one thing will be just like Zacchaeus. And half of my stuff I've given to the poor. I'm going to repay the people that I've wronged. Our possessions don't have a grip on us anymore. Instead, we see everything we've been given as a tool given to us by God to extend his kingdom. So the first parable, are you ready? And are you prepared for the second coming of Jesus? The second parable, does the way that you're stewarding your possessions suggest that you're really ready for the return of Jesus Christ? If he were to return today, how would he feel about how you've handled his possessions or your gifts and talents and abilities? But he doesn't stop there. There's a third parable in this sequence. It's the parable of the sheep and the goats. This one, um, it, it really speaks more specifically to the judgment. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 it says, But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. This is like the judgment day, right? right? This is, that's what's happening here. It says, And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And what he's going to say is to the sheep, he's going to say, Hey, come in here, sit at my right hand, the goats. I want you to be on my left hand. 
But I want you to hear the specific words that Jesus told us that he was going to say to each of them. To the sheep who were on the right, he said, Come, you who are blessed of my Father. Now, you're the blessed ones. Inherit my kingdom. It's been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And I'm like, awesome. You know, this is where we want to be. This is what we've been hopeful for. But he continues to speak. He says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Well, the sheep are clearly glad to hear at the final judgment that they get to enter into his glory, receive their inheritance. But they say, uh, hey, when did, we, when did we feed you or give you a drink or see you naked and clothe you or visit you when you were sick? When did that happen? I guess anticipating the question. He says, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine. Look around you. Think about the people that you live around, the people you work with. To the extent that you did it to any of these, and you did it unto me. Then he speaks to the goats for a minute, those who have been placed on his left. He has a different message for them. He says, depart from me, accursed ones into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. To the extent that you did not do these things, feed the hungry, give the thirsty something to drink, care for the sick, to the extent that you did not do these things to one of the least of these, you did not do them to me. The words they heard were to part. Are you prepared for the second coming of Christ? How would you answer the question if you stood before God? But but then there are more questions, right? If you stood before God right now and he asked you to give an account for how you've stewarded his possessions, how would you answer him? Would Would he say to you, well done, I'm going to entrust you with even more because you've been utilizing what he's entrusted to build his kingdom? And then there's a third piece here. You were to stand before God. It's like, hey, how have you cared for the least of these in your culture, in your neighborhood? Students, how have you cared for those kids that don't have friends in your school? For those who are sick and hurting? Have you visited those in prison? Have you helped clothe the naked? How have you loved the people that God loves? And if we come to the conclusion that we haven't done those things but rather we've really been all about ourselves, that as much as we might say to the first question, no, 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 I trust Jesus to save me, but we begin to answer the next two questions with regard to how we steward his possessions and how we love his people, what it really looks like is we're not a people after God's own heart seeking first his kingdom, but really we're a people after our own heart who have been seeking our kingdom. And rather than loving the people that God loves, that he gave his life for, oftentimes we've been insulated in our own little safe little houses, only caring for the people who are going to give something back to us. As a church of God, this should not be true of us, but rather as people who were the outsiders. We were the ones who were sick, and we were the ones who were hungry. We were the ones who were thirsty. We were the ones with no clothing. We were the ones who were condemned, and Jesus Christ came to us, and he offered himself on our behalf. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. He is the one who set us free. Like, that's what Jesus has done for us, and as the people of God and disciples of Jesus Christ, we, to give ourselves in service to other people, leveraging everything that God has given us in order to extend his kingdom seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness and just trusting God that he's going to provide all of those other things for us. So I told you that this message is really, you think about the second coming of Christ, it's, it's figuring out where you are. Are you ready for the second coming of Jesus? 
My hope and my prayer for us as the, as the church, Cross Community Church, the church of Jesus Christ, that when we think about the second coming of Christ, we're not like that slave who buried the treasure in the ground. We're not like the goats who didn't care for his people. Uh, the judgment day is not a day that we look forward to uh, for those of us who have not been faithful with, God, with what God has entrusted, but for those of us who have come to abiding faith in Jesus Christ and we've allowed him to work in our hearts and begin to work in us and through us to bless his people. And we can look forward to the judgment day with hearts full of hope that we could hear the words like, come on in, receive the inheritance that I have prepared for you. Man, I've got a place. So what I want to do is take a few minutes and ask you to examine your heart. How would you answer God? Have you come to a genuine saving faith in Jesus Christ where God opened your eyes and you believe the gospel and you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. He's Lord and you're his servant. Do you see everything that you have as belonging to God and, and that your role is to steward those things to build his kingdom? And do you look around you and you see those who are hurting, those people who are in need, those people who are sick, and see that those are people who are loved by God and that you have been called to serve and to care for them in the same way that God has served and cared for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your, your word and for these oftentimes warnings. Warnings that we could be deceived and sometimes thinking we're prepared when we're really not. God, we're thankful for how you have come to us, the sick, the hungry, the thirsty, God, we who stood received condemnation. God, you acted on our behalf to save us from those things and to give us new life in you. Lord, for the men and women in this room, those who may not know you, I pray that today would be this day of salvation. May you draw them unto salvation, Father. Uh, for those of us who maybe we've been distracted, God, maybe we haven't realized that by serving others, we we're actually serving you. Father, I pray that today would be a day of conviction and repentance that we could begin to live the life that you tell us is abundant, a life where we become great by becoming the servant of all. Lord Jesus, we love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.